Well, we are continuing in our sermon series, Supreme, this morning, and what we're doing is taking four weeks to walk through the book of Colossians. Last week, we took a look at chapter one. It may come as no shock to you. Today, we'll look at chapter two, and uh, next week, we'll look at chapter three. And so if you'll do me a favor, before next week, uh, read and study a little bit of Colossians three and just look over that. That'll help you prepare for the sermon uh, as Nathan will be back with us and walking through that. Um, But Colossians, if you're not familiar with it, it is a letter written by the apostle Paul. Paul wrote it in, we think about about 62 AD, he wrote it from prison to the church in Colossae. Now, unlike most churches that Paul wrote to, uh, he had never actually visited the city of Colossians. Paul uh, not only did not plant the church, but it's believed that he had never even been there. And so we know, though, because of this letter, that Paul had heard about the Colossian church and knew some of the struggles they were facing, issues they were dealing with. And so he wrote this letter as an opportunity to encourage them and challenge them to stand against a dangerous belief that had been spreading among them. Now, this belief was called Gnosticism. And we talked a little bit about it last week, but Gnosticism was the belief that anything of this world was evil. And so it questioned the divinity of Jesus and taught that salvation came through good works and knowledge. So Paul writes the book of Colossians as an opportunity to remind the Colossians of the supremacy of Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, he is exactly who he says he was, and did what he said he did, and he is the very center and focus of our faith. And if we can have confidence in who Jesus is and what he did, that changes everything. We can have confidence that his sacrifice and a relationship with him is enough for forgiveness of sins and to live in relationship with him. But the issue was the Gnostics Gnostics were spreading a lie in the opposite direction. They said that it was not faith, but good works and knowledge that led to salvation. They believed that rules led to righteousness. And so in chapter two, Paul is gonna specifically challenge this belief against rules and to say that that is not the case, that it's actually in opposition to this, that it's about faith in Jesus. And so there's this concept throughout this chapter that we're gonna talk about. And what I wanna focus on this morning is that Paul is teaching that it's not about rules, it's about the relationship. And so Paul believed if we could understand who Jesus was and understand our relationship with him and how we are to respond to them, then that would change everything and it would lead us to know what it means to really have faith in Jesus and to live out our faith as followers of Christ. And so I want us to dive into chapter two this morning and talk about this idea of rules versus relationship and how that changes things for us. So let's start by looking at verses one through five this morning. Paul says, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and unified in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I tell you all of this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Now, one thing you got to love about Paul is how personally he feels for the churches around him. The church in Colossae is not a church he ever visited, but you can tell even just in these first few verses that Paul feels an intense burden and responsibility for the church. And so this letter, it is not some letter of greeting, it's not a letter of well-wishing, but it is Paul challenging and encouraging the Colossians to grow in their faith. And he says he does this because he loves them and is fighting for them. And I hope you know that as pastors and staff of Karis City, this is the same kind of burden and responsibility that we share for you, that we do this because we love you and we're fighting for you. This isn't some business to us. This isn't something that we just do for fun. It's not just free time. We do this because we understand that eternity is at stake and we want you to know and love Jesus. And so we, it's our job to pastor you and to lead you, to shepherd you, to teach you, to encourage you, and to also challenge you to continue to grow in your relationship with God and understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. And we do that because of a deep love and passion for you that has been given to us by God. And this is incredibly important because there are beliefs out there that are incredibly dangerous and sound really good at first. Paul talks about this in verse four. He says that he doesn't want the church to be deceived by fine sounding arguments, things that look good on paper when you hear them, right? But they're destructive. And so Gnosticism, it was one of these beliefs. Gnosticism taught that everything of the world was sinful or evil. And therefore your goal was to focus on heavenly things, which in and of itself sounds pretty good. But the issue was this belief led to the teaching that because Jesus was on earth, 
He could not be God, and therefore salvation would have to be earned through good works and knowledge of heavenly things. And so Paul makes it clear in verse 3 that his goal with the Colossian church is for them to be encouraged in love and united in spirit. Paul says, I want you to be united in what you believe and to stand firm in who you believe Jesus is. He says that is the utmost important. And I love that he takes a specific shot at Gnosticism here. Gnosticism taught the belief that you had to reach a certain level of knowledge in order to be saved. And so Paul says that his goal with the Colossian church is that they would know the full riches of understanding and that they would know the mysteries of God. And Paul says, well, who are these mysteries? Christ. Paul says that it's all about Christ. He says, look, you think I need rules to be saved? You think I need knowledge to be saved? He said, you guys can't stick with me. I know more than you've ever known. I have obeyed more than you've ever behaved because Paul knew better than anybody. It wasn't about what we did, right? If anybody had claim to say that they could be saved because of what they did or what they knew, Paul's like the prime example of that, right? He's a chief Pharisee. The man was a zealous follower of God, a zealous follower of God's laws. He knew scripture inside and out, and yet it is Paul who says none of that matters. He says, it's not about what I did. It's about what Jesus did for me. And so Paul, in response to all this, he says, man, all the knowledge in the world and all the obedience, he says, it pales in comparison to a relationship with Jesus. This is how Paul says this in Philippians 3, 7 through 9. He says, but wherever considered gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, it's not about knowing the mysteries of heaven to be saved. It's about knowing Jesus. It's not about doing all of the right things and trying to work in obedience to earn your salvation. It's about accepting salvation freely through faith because of the grace that Jesus offers. It's not about rules. It's about the relationship. And so when we begin to understand that it's not about what we do, but what's been done for us, Paul says that changes everything because it shifts the focus away from us and it puts the focus back on Jesus who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And to Paul, that mattered more than anything else. And so Paul says, and as he talks about this, he says, look, you can't let these things deceive you. You can't let them get in the way of this. Gnostics believed that we had to change our minds in order to follow God. But Paul says, no, you follow Jesus, and Jesus changes your heart. And out of that heart change comes the renewing of the mind that we seek. It's not about rules. It's about the relationship. Look at our next verses with me, six through eight. Paul says, so then, just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So Paul starts these verses with so then, letting us know this is a continuation of his thought previously. In verse five, he commends the Colossians. He says, look, you guys have not fallen prey to this. You've been believing what you're supposed to believe. And so in verse six, he tells them, look, keep doing the right things. You're on the right track. Don't let anyone take you off of it. And when Paul talks about receiving Christ, the Greek word there has a connotation of accepting a tradition. And so what Paul is saying, he says, look, don't let what you believe about Jesus, what you know to be true, to be taken over by man-made philosophy. And so Paul's idea here is that the tradition of Christ should always take precedence over the traditions of man because Jesus is supreme. And so in verse 8, Paul challenges, he says, do not be taken captive to hollow and deceitful theology. And this word taken captive comes from a Greek word that lends to the idea of being plundered, being robbed, and and kind of being taken from in the night. And, And so Paul is saying ultimately that this beautiful gift that we have, salvation, it comes through faith in Jesus. And he says, don't let man made theology try and steal this away from you by telling you that it comes through a hollow practice of rules. He says, don't let them steal your salvation with a lie. Now, The reason he says this is there are all sorts of beliefs that are kind of throughout the Bible and throughout the church, and and they're spread in different ways, and 
the issue with them is, is they sound good to us at first, right? They seem like they might be good. They might be beneficial to the believer. But Paul says you have to be careful because some of these things sound really good, but they're actually very destructive. Now, one of these things that we see this in the church today is something called legalism. Legalism is by definition uh, an excessive adherence to moral or religious law. And so in the church, you typically see this as some kind of additional requirements, whether it's tradition or rules, towards salvation in order to be saved. And so they would say it's essentially it's Jesus plus something equals salvation. And so legalism will tell you that ultimately you're responsible for your salvation. It's, a, it's like saying if Jesus covered 50% of the bill, you got the other 50%. So if you can figure it out how to pay it, good deal. If you can't, well, too bad. And so Paul says this is the issue, and it manifests itself in all sorts of requirements. There are some groups in the church that put strict requirements on the secular music. Some people will put requirements on traditions, like greeting with the holy kiss. Amen that that's not true. I would not want to greet any of you with the holy kiss. I love y'all. But they'll say things like holy kiss, communion, things like these are requirements to be saved. Some groups will take it a step further than that and say that there is a level of obedience to God's law that you must hit in order to be saved. And some would even put requirements on the moment of salvation and say that in order to be saved, you have to receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues in that moment. Some would say that you have to be saved on the moment of baptism, that it's baptism that offers forgiveness of sins. And, and there's many more examples that we could give here, but these kinds of beliefs and teachings are what Paul warned us against. And it's not the heart of the issue that's the problem with them, right? Some of these may be very good things for you to practice, and some of you may, right? You may have specific protections and guardrails, as they're sometimes referred to in your life, things that protect you from sinning. You may believe that you don't drink because you don't want to get drunk, which is a sin. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you take your personal convictions and then look down on other people when they don't do what you do, survey says, you might be a legalist. And so Paul says the issue is when these things move beyond personal convictions to requirements for salvation, he says we've gotten it wrong because it puts the focus on us and not on Jesus. And he says that's the issue with this, that they emphasize rules over relationship. They make salvation about what we do instead of what Jesus did for us. And here's the deal. Any gospel that makes it about us is a false gospel. And this is why Paul says not to be taken captive by these things, right? He says, look, don't let them steal away what God has given you. Your, your salvation, it comes through faith. Don't fall prey to the lie that it comes from these other things. So the reality is, no matter how good it sounds, a gospel that preaches Jesus plus blank is a false gospel. The gospel is founded entirely upon the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. And any gospel that preaches some other requirement other than faith in Jesus, it's incorrect. And Paul did not consider this a matter to contend with. Paul says this is the very core of our faith, that if you can't grasp that salvation comes by faith alone, he says you have missed the very point of Christianity. And so Paul talks about, he says, man, these people believe these things of the traditions of man and of the elemental forces, spiritual forces of the world. And what he's talking about there is a Greek word called stoicheion or stoicheion. And what it translates to literally is elementary principles or basic principles. And the most basic literal definition is like the ABCs, the alphabet. And so when Paul talks about stoicheion, it's this idea that these are supposed to be concepts that even children can grasp. Now, I coached football for a couple of years in Mississippi and I coach linemen. I know that may shock you when you look at me, but one of my jobs as a lineman coach was to teach them the specific stances that they would do on both sides of the ball and for different types of plays. Now, if you don't know anything about football, there are three stances for linemen, and they're very simple. It's the two-point stance, the three-point stance, and the four-point stance. Very simple. All that means is the number coincides with the amount of points of contact you have with the ground using your hands and your feet. It's such a simple concept that six-year-olds playing peewee football can be taught these things. So, you would think that if you're coaching high school football and dealing with high school boys, they'd get these concepts. But you're missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. High school boys are Neanderthals. <laughs> they, they can be ugly, they can be smelly, and they're stupid. And so it never failed. 
I would always have some Einstein on our team who you could tell he was taking these simple principles and you would think that I had shared with him the most complex calculus for equation on this planet. I mean, you could see it, the gears in his head just working overtime, grinding away, trying to figure out what I could possibly mean by a three-point stance, and I'm sitting here dumbfounded going, how do you not get this? I've got children that know what I'm saying. You can't figure out you put your hand on the ground? So easy a kid can figure it out. Paul says it's the same thing that was happening in Colossae that they could not grasp the ABCs, the very simple elementary principles of Christianity was getting away from them. They were relying on the elementary principles of the world. They had reverted back to what they knew. See, throughout Judaism and non-Jewish religions, there was this principle that kind of overlapped over everything, and it was cause and effect, right? It was if you did good things, you received good things. If you did bad things, you receive bad things, and so on and so forth. But the issue with this is that this principle died with Jesus because we did bad things. We sinned and we rebelled against God, but God, through Jesus, now offers us grace and forgiveness through faith in Christ, right? It's not something we deserved, but it's something that was given to us anyway. And so groups like the Gnostics, they couldn't get past this concept. They still were clinging to what these childish principles of cause and effect were, and so they did not believe that the sacrifice of Jesus was sufficient. They did not believe it was enough. And so they would say, no, no, you don't get it. It wasn't it. We've got to earn it. We've got to balance the scale in our favor. If we can tip it in our favor, we get to God. And Paul says, no, that's backwards. You've got it all wrong. He says that Jesus is the cause through his sacrifice and the effect is the forgiveness of sins through faith in him. Just think about this logically for a second. If everything was still about rules with God, why change anything? Judaism was a religion comprised of 613 oral and written laws. If you think of a law, they had it. So why then, if you were going to create a new religion with rules, why not just keep the old one? Why not keep doing things the exact same way? Why send your son? Why allow Jesus to die on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins if his sacrifice was insufficient to cover our debt? It doesn't make sense. It only makes sense if what Jesus did changed everything. It only makes sense if Jesus fulfilled the law, not created a new one. It only makes sense if Jesus, his sacrifice covers our sin. See, Jesus didn't die for you to follow rules. He died for you to follow him. So don't put your confidence in man-made traditions. Don't put your faith in following rules. Put your faith in Jesus because it's only through him that you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It's not about rules. It's about the relationship. Look with me at our, last, our next verses, 9 through 12. Paul says, for in Christ, the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you've been brought to fullness. He's the head over every power and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So how can we have confidence that Jesus' sacrifice is enough? How can we trust that it's about rule, not about rules, but about a relationship with Jesus? Well, Paul says that we trust in the supremacy of Jesus, that if we can understand who Jesus is, then we can trust what Jesus did. And so Paul goes on to say, he says that all the deity in Christ lives in bodily form. And what Paul is saying is that Jesus was not simply a man. Now, there are scholars all over the world that would say that's exactly what he was, right? Nobody really refutes that Jesus was a historical person. It's pretty hard to do. There's a lot of evidence out there. And so most scholars will agree that Jesus was a real person, but where they struggle is with his divinity. And so most people would love to claim, and they do claim, they'll say, Jesus, he was a good teacher, he was a good man. Even religions will say he was a good prophet, but they do not want to say that he was God. 
And so Gnosticism made the same exact argument. They said, look, because everything in the world is evil, that means that Jesus has to be evil and therefore he can't be God. And so Paul makes it very clear. He says he is not just some man. He is God in the flesh, that he is fully man and fully God. All of the fullness of deity lives in Jesus. And some people would even go on to claim, they say, well, you may say that, but Jesus never claimed to be God. It's not true. Look what Jesus said in John 8, 58 through 59. He says, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And at this, they picked up stones to throw and to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. They weren't trying to stone Jesus because he was a good prophet or because he was a disturber of the peace. They're trying to stone Jesus because he claimed his divinity. He says, you want to know who God is? It's me. He says, before Abraham was, I am. See, the reality is Jesus isn't some man to be admired. He's the God who is to be worshiped. And he reigns supreme over all creation because he is the Lord of all. He is God in the flesh. And Paul makes it clear that he is the head over all power and authority. And what that means is that what Jesus did and what he established, it is the final say. That when Jesus says you are free from your sin because of what I've done, that's it. That's the end of the discussion because he is the supreme ruler over all. He is God of the universe in flesh. And so if you think you need Jesus plus something for salvation, you're saying Jesus isn't enough. You're not trusting in who Jesus is, that the God of the universe would need your help to accomplish his purpose. I mean, how arrogant is it for us to think that? But if you trust in who Jesus says he is and in what he did, you can trust that his sacrifice is enough. And in that, you can have confidence that you were brought to the fullness of Christ, that there is nothing that has to be added, nothing that can be taken away, but that you were made completely whole because of what Jesus did and who he is. And Paul talks about this in verse 11 this way. He says, you were also circumcised with a, with a circumcision not performed by human hands. And so Paul's gonna go on to use circumcision in just a minute, baptism, as an example of how this change comes from Jesus and not what we do. Circumcision in and of itself, it was an external change, something that was an altering of the body in order to show other people that you belong to God. They could look at you and know that man He's a follower of God. But Paul says that this new circumcision in Christ is different. It's not an external act. It's not something that we do. It's an internal change that comes through a relationship with Jesus when we make the decision to follow him as Lord and Savior. And out of that change, we mark this moment of change with obedience. See, it's the saving and then the obedience follows. In the Old Testament, this was done through circumcision, but we now do this through baptism by immersion. I want to be clear, baptism does not save us. It's not the washing away of our sins, but it's an incredibly important act of obedience for us as followers of Christ. And so here at Karis City, this is something that we take very seriously. We do it a specific way, and we do it for specific reasons. First, we baptize by immersion, and we do that because the word for baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, which quite literally means to immerse or dunk someone underwater. So first, it's what Jesus did. It's what he modeled for us. It's what he commanded. But we also do it this way specifically because it's this beautiful picture of what happens. And, and Paul talks about it in Romans 12. He says, look, when we repent of our sins, we're dying to our old life, just as Jesus died for our sins, right? And he says that as we're buried in the water, it's like being buried in the grave with Jesus. And as we rise from the water, it's like Jesus rising from life. It is this beautiful picture of what happens. But baptism isn't saying that the water changed you. It's saying that Jesus has changed you and you're showing the world a beautiful picture, a symbol of what it looks like to be changed by Jesus. It's not the obedience that saves you. You are first saved by Jesus and the act of obedience demonstrates that. And so if you've never been baptized by immersion, I would encourage you and challenge you to do it. Not because you have to do it to be saved. I wanna be very clear on that. Baptism does not save you, once again. It is not the water that washes away your sins. That comes only through the blood of Jesus. But it's an important act of obedience that we follow through as followers of Christ. And so if that's not something you've done and you'd like to do that, we can. You can talk to me after service. I'll, I'll be in the back of the room and I'd love to chat with you about that. On your Connect card, you can let us know that you're interested in baptism. But I'm gonna tell you, if you wanna be baptized, you don't have to wait. You can do it today if you want to. I am ready. I will go put my wet clothes back on and we will hop in that pool. I've got t-shirts, I've got shorts, I've got towels. We can do it.
if you want to be baptized, you don't have to wait. (laughs) It's not our obedience that saves us. Jesus saves us, and the obedience follows. And so Paul makes it clear over and over again that we're not saved by what we do, but what's been done for us. And let's be honest, that's a good thing. Because we don't make it. We don't hit the mark. We miss it. Romans 3.23 tells us we fall short of the glory of God. But we are saved because Jesus paid the price for us. Look at what Paul says in verses 13 through 15. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Everything that we could not accomplish, Jesus did for us. Every rule that we failed to keep, Jesus kept in a perfect life. We had a debt of sin that we could not pay. Jesus paid for it on the cross. And in his resurrection, he now offers us eternal life. And in his resurrection, he demonstrated that he is supreme over all, that he holds authority, that nothing could hold him down. If the grave could not hold Jesus back, nothing's stopping Jesus. And because of that, we have confidence that Christ in his supremacy has set us free. He has set us free from sin. He has set us free from the law. We are free in Christ. And as we experience that change in Jesus, we then get to live in obedience, not because we have to, but because we get to in response of what Jesus did for us. It's not about the rules. It's about the relationship. Look at our last verses with me in verses 16 through 17. Paul says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. You got to love when Paul uses the word therefore because you know it's there for a reason. And Paul is kind of wrapping up here. He says, look, because of this great victory we have, because we've been set free in Christ, he says, man, do not let anybody judge you back into legalism. Do not believe the lie that there's anything that you have to do to earn God's forgiveness, to earn God's love and his favor. And some of you, you're sitting here stuck in the guilt of what you did in the past. Some of you are are still stuck in the fear of what you think you have to do later in order to be saved and forgiven, to be loved by God. You're stuck in the rules. You still feel like it's something that you have to do in order to earn this. But the reality is it was taken care of. That Jesus paid the price for you. On the cross, Jesus uttered three words. He said, it is finished. With his death, He permanently paid for the sins of the world. And with his resurrection, he permanently decided that we are free. In his authority, he declares that we are free. He demonstrated his his supremacy over all. And in that supremacy, we get to have confidence in who Jesus is and what he's done for us. You can rest in the promise that Jesus is enough. He is enough to forgive your sins. He is enough to offer eternal life. He is enough to radically change your life in ways that you can't even explain. And all of that doesn't happen because of something you do. It's not, your life doesn't change because you change some actions. Your life changes because Jesus changes you. It's not about rules, it's about the relationship. And so the question you have to ask yourself this morning is do you trust that Jesus is enough? Do you have faith that he is who he says he is and did what he said he did? Do you believe that he is the son of God who came to the earth, who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins? Do you believe that three days later he rose from the grave, establishing himself as the ruler over all, the supreme God over all of creation? And do you believe that in that authority, Jesus is sufficient, he is enough to cover your sins, that he is enough to offer you life? Do you believe that he is enough? If not, I beg you, trust in Jesus. Believe that he is the Christ, 
the Son of the living God, Lord and Savior, who died for you, who bled for you, who rose from the grave. Repent of your sins and follow him in faith. Following Jesus is the best decision you'll ever make. It's freedom from sin. It's freedom from the law. It's a freedom in Christ that changes everything for us. And so if you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus today, please come talk to me. I'll be in the back of the room in just a minute. I would love to talk to you about that and walk with you through that process. But here's the other side of this. If you trust that Jesus is enough, put your confidence in him. Continue to rest in the finished work of his sacrifice and trust that in his supremacy, that in Jesus is who he says he is, that he holds the final word, that nobody can ever take it away from you. There is nothing to add or take away from it. Jesus said, it is finished. End of story. And we can have confidence in that. Confidence that we have a relationship with Jesus that leads to eternal life and forgiveness of sins. I want to uh, close this morning with a quote from Rory Shiner, who's a pastor and theologian. He's a chair of the Gospel Coalition in Australia. And he said this, he said, in the death on the cross, Jesus becomes the place of refuge, the place in the world where the full wrath of God has already been spent. Therefore, to stand in Christ is to stand in a place where the wrath of God will never be felt because it has already been there. Jesus took the place for us. In his sacrifice, he paid for our sins, something that we couldn't do. We failed to earn it. We failed to measure up to what God did for us. But this impossible act of reconciliation took place when Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave three days later. And it's confidence in who Jesus is and what he did that gives us confidence in what faith leads us to. And it's not about doing the right things. It's not about following rules and following the laws of man, but it's about a relationship with Jesus. And that relationship changes everything. And so my challenge to you this morning is don't get caught up in the rules. Don't chase the rules. Chase the relationship. Put your faith in Jesus because he changes everything. It's not about rules. It's about the relationship. Let's pray.